Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Alison, for this kind introduction. Um, let me just see if this works. It does work. All right, very good. So um, I was asked to talk in uh, 25 minutes about uh, creating policy-relevant evidence. And uh, I, I thought that uh, um, the presentation this morning from Professors Crimmins and Williams were a perfect setup for this. What I want to do is I'm going to go fairly quickly because I wanted to touch on four points about what I think are the challenges that we have in population health to generate evidence to inform dealing with some of the challenges that were raised this morning. And then we'll, uh, we'll get some uh, comments on my comments and then we'll have a conversation. So let me jump in. So I, I just want to just start with all started here. We actually do have a, a, a long tradition of population health interventions, and I could give many examples here, but I'm just showing my favorite example, which is the North Karelia um, example in the 70s and 80s in Finland, where, which really was a population-wide experiment, shifting the, the uh, cholesterol curve on the left and lowering mortality from coronary heart disease. I think it's a, sort of, it's a fairly classic example of a population health approach that dealt with a problem and resulted in solutions. So I, I, I don't want to forget in a, in a session we're talking about challenges that this, we do have a tradition of doing this. That's number one. The second thing is that we are at a period where perhaps as a result of some of the challenges you heard about this morning, there are several emerging interesting experiments in population health. And it is perhaps opposite that we're doing this session than about challenges in measuring these because this is one from uh, the uh, hospital associated with uh, my university, which is Boston City Hospital, which has recently been investing in housing. And there are several other systems and hospitals and uh, localities that are doing things like this. So I actually think it's a very good time to say, how do we ask ourselves questions about what are the challenges in evaluating these population health interventions? And then, one more thing before I get into the challenges. Actually, we do have evidence. I, I, I think sometimes, in, in, in my latter years, I find that I'm, I'm insisting on being more optimistic. So while, while I was asked to talk about the challenge, perhaps because the alternative is too dark to contemplate, the, uh, um, um, the, the, while I've been asked to talk about the challenges in generating evidence, we actually do have evidence. And I do want to point out for people who don't know it, this is the um, um, uh, CDC High Five uh, website, which I, I saw John Auerbach in the room who started this. And um, to my mind, I actually think it's the best repository of the data on population health evidence. And you know, just to run through a few examples, these are all from the website. There's, they summarize nicely the evidence on uh, housing and population health, um, on transportation population health, on early childhood education. We heard a little bit about early childhood education population health, as well as on things like income, income supports, earned income tax credits. So there are these... Um, there is evidence out there. You know, I can, I can equally well give you a talk that says there isn't enough evidence, which certainly there isn't, and I've written quite a bit about that. But I do want to point out that there is a body of evidence out there. And for those of you who haven't seen it, this is a report that just uh, came out recently um, from the Yale Global Health Leadership Institute by Lauren Taylor and, and uh, Elizabeth Bradley's group, which I think is actually a very good summary of the state of the evidence on... It's called social determinants, and I think it's called social determinants for sort of reasons of sellability, but ultimately it is about policy-informed evidence to improve population health. So, having said that, having said that we have a tradition of doing this, having said that there is a body of evidence, what are the challenges? So I, I, I could talk about a lot of challenges, but I want to talk about four. So my presentation is structured about four challenges, and I want to highlight why I think they are all challenges. And the reason I'm doing that is because is trying to say, well, if we want to generate more evidence, then we need to deal with these limitations. So let me just go through them one by one. Number one. Number one is external validity. And um, I have written on this, and, and, and I think uh, you know, my disciplinary orientation, as uh, Dr. Ayello said, is epidemiology. And epidemiology has led us down a little bit of a, a, a troublesome path on this, because epidemiology has privileged internal validity for many decades over external validity. And uh, to my mind, internal validity and external validity are both important. So perhaps I'm a little bit of a mission to elevate external validity as, a, a, as an issue for us to look at. And I think in the context of evidence-based solutions to population health, external validity really matters. So why does it matter? So suppose we want to know, does a particular intervention result in normal tension? Does it lower blood pressure? And there's many efforts out there to result in normal tension at population level. Well, you start with a population. Now, I'm, uh, by the way, I have a, number of, a lot of numbers in my presentation, but I figured it comes at a good time in the morning. Everybody's awake after the initial inspiring talks um, uh, and you know, not, not too close to lunch. So numbers, two by two table, disease, non-disease, exposed, non-exposed. And all I want to see is um, uh, this is a sample from a population. You do a sample from population and you find risk difference of zero. That's all I want you to see. 
there's no association. Now you've seen that before, or sometimes you don't see it because of course the scientists who find no association don't publish it, but leaving that aside. Um, um, then you do another study, that's another whole set of problems, we can talk about that. Um, um, you do another sample from the population, you do it again, and these numbers change, and now all of a sudden you have a, a risk difference of 0.33, which is 33 additional cases for every 100 cases of an intervention, and another study happens, and it happens again, and now you have 10 for 100. And this happens all the time, like it happens all the time. You see intervention, 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 you have different samples, gives you different results. And our general approach to this is sort of a bit of a collective shrug and say, oh, well, the world is complicated, or else sometimes we, we, we do what we do often in population health science, I think we do it in all of science, unfortunately, is we pick on the paper and say, well, the paper had flaws. <laughs> raise, your, raise your hand who hasn't done that. <laughs> it's between you and your conscience. This is, <laughs> This is where being, having been brought up very Catholic comes in handy. Um, uh, the, uh, why is this? Yes, there might be flaws, but the point I'm trying to make is that when you focus on the study flaws, you're focusing only on internal validity. A lot of the reason why this is the case is external validity. It's because the intervention alone does not cause normal tension. You actually need other things that go with that intervention to also result in normal tension. Now, why is this? Well, this actually goes back to epi-1. So if all of you who took epi-1, and it may have been taught well or poorly, probably was taught poorly, because most epi-1 is taught poorly, but um, um, if, if, if it were taught well, you would have remembered that ultimately there is this very simple notion that you have two causes, X and Y, and they're both necessary but insufficient causes. You actually need both of them to have an outcome. So these cases where you have only X, only Y, or neither, will all result in no outcome. And when we do our studies, when the intervention is the X, you're missing the Y, and the Y typically is the population-wide factor that is causing some of the issues that you heard about this morning from Professor Williams and Professor Crimmins. So that results in different samples giving you different outcomes. And the reason is that we are not appreciating the fact that there are other typically population-wide factors that we are not measuring. So going back to my numbers, these are the three samples that I showed. This one, what, oops, apologize. What was the difference? Some sort of social condition. I, you know, we can... We can use any number of social conditions. I'm labeling it social condition intentionally, just to be vague about it. Here, it didn't, wasn't there. Here, 50% of the population had it, and here, 40% of the population had it. So when you work that through, and you can work through the numbers, and you're all welcome to my slides, and you can work through the numbers afterwards. In this first slide, the reason that there is no association between the intervention wasn't because the intervention might not work. It's because you didn't have the cause why. You didn't have the other social condition. As a result, nothing happened. In the next sample, this is samples two and three, in the next sample, half of the people were exposed to social condition. So as a result, only half would actually going to result in normal tension. And this one, it was 40%. And in fact, when you look at the numbers, you see that in the unexposed, people who did not receive your intervention, 17% of the un unexposed end up with normal tension in both cases, because those are then driven by the other factor you are not measuring. So the bottom line is this. Under the very plausible assumption that there are other causes any intervention health association can only be understood if you understand the other factors. And if we're interested in the health of populations, and we sort of say we are, so if we're interested in the health of populations, we need to pay attention to the other co-occurring causes. Otherwise, we'll not understand whether interventions work or not. So that's challenge one. Challenge two, we're interested in the health of populations, which means we're interested in forces that are all around us. The problem with forces that are all around us is that we forget about them, and they are pesky meaning they're not highly variable between individuals which challenge how we do our typical study designs. My favorite metaphor on this, which I've written about, some of you may have read, is my goldfish metaphor. Very briefly, these are my pet goldfish. I want them to be healthy, so I tell them to exercise, swim around their bowl 10 times clockwise, 10 times counterclockwise every day. I tell them not to eat too much of the little flaky food that I give them on top of the bowl so they don't get fat. And I tell them when they have goldfish sex to have safe sex. Um, um, all of that is good. And I do that, um, come on, that's what we do in population health. We do it all the time. And then the goldfish still die. I'm like, ah, my goldfish still died. Why did that happen? They're like, ah, I forgot to change the water. And if you don't change the goldfish water, they're going to die. Why am I using that? Well, it's because the water is a force that's all around us, and we frequently don't forget it. Uh, don't think about it. What is the force all around us? Well, Professor Williams talked about a number of these. It's racism, it's gender inequity, it's income inequality, it's, it's poor, lack of social cohesion. All of these factors, they're forces all around us. And they are ubiquitous, which makes them hard to see and hard to measure. Do they, do they result in us making mistakes? They result in us making mistakes all the time. We forget about these all the time. Let's go back to the 80s, uh, the, the uh, crack baby epidemic. 
right? A lot of, a lot of uh, um, uh, writing, a lot of public media around uh, gestational crack cocaine. And uh, of course, until a few years later, where it became clear that a lot of these uh, um, uh, so-called crack babies, actually there was no difference in cognitive functioning between controls and GCE, which is gestational crack cocaine. Why is it that there was all this outcry? Well, it actually had nothing really probably to do with the gestational cocaine. It probably had everything to do with environmental stimulation and poverty. That a lot of the mothers who actually were having um, uh, babies while there was also gestational cocaine were deeply poor. And that was a ubiquitous factor that we forgot. Now, you all say the problem with showing an example like this is you're like, well, that was the 80s. We weren't born then or we were looking around the room. We were young then. Um, um, so we're now much better than that. We're smarter than that. So in order to test whether we're smarter than that, let's go to a question about our smarts. So we're all sitting here in the National Academy of Sciences building, um, which always feels nice to come in here, you know, busts on the walls, etc. Um, um, so every, let's assume that everybody in this room is smart, and let's make a simple assumption, very simple assumption, that the only two things matter for you to be smart. Number one is your genes, and number two is a positive environment in which you grew up, okay? A smartogenic environment. It's not a, you can call it whatever you want. It's not such a crazy assumption, right? Something genetic and something about your environment, all right? So that's my assumption. Everybody with me? Yeah. I have a simple question. What proportion of your being smart is due to your genes? I would like everybody to answer this for themselves. Now, this is my holding you to it. I'm going to afterwards come back, and I'm going to ask you to be honest about how correct you were. What percent of your cognitive ability is due to your genes in a world which assumes that two things matter, your genes and your environment. I'd like everybody to come put an answer in their own head. Everybody done? Yes? Okay, so let's do the math. Let's create a world. This is the world, great people. And uh, my convention is going to be, I'm going to show genes. This is the smart gene as showed as, as black. So the, when the great people become black, that's the smart gene. And when you're in the smartogenic environment, it's green. Okay, so you need black and green to become smart. Um, the only other thing I'm going to do in this simulation is I'm throwing in a few randomly smart people. So red is smart, this cognitive ability plus, because we all know people who are really smart who we say, God, we know their parents didn't come from there and they grew up in a terrible environment didn't come from there. So there, there's some randomness, we all know that. So I'm just throwing that in. Actually, you need to throw it in also for mathematical reasons, but leaving that aside. So the, the simulation is very simple. I'm adding the gene to the environment. Everybody with me? The black and the green together becomes red, right? So, scenario one. Scenario one, here are the genes. This is the same pattern of black as you had before. I just made a dot so you can see it behind the green. This environment is predominantly smartogenic. There's some of the red, the random red people, but the black and the green are going to become red. You see that? So we can calculate. We can calculate what's the proportion of smart that's due to the gene. And the proportion of smart due to the gene is essentially 100% because everybody with the gene became smart. Do you see that? All the, all the black became red. So this says that 100% of your smart is due to your genes. Now you begin to get nervous. You're like, wait a second, he's pulling something, he's pulling the wool over our eyes. I'm not. Scenario two, the gene pattern is not different. You see it? Still the same, black. The green has now changed. The green is only in the corner here. These are black, black plus green becomes red. What proportion of the smart is due to your genes? Well, you can calculate it. The proportion attributable risk is 40%, it's a relative risk 1.7, which means 40% of your brains are due to your genes. So, the answer to the question, in a universe where two things matter for your, for your smarts, genes and environment, what proportion of your smarts are due to your genes? The answer to the question is, it is mathematically impossible to tell unless you tell me about the environment. How many of you had that answer? <laughs> I hid nothing from you. I told you the assumptions. I pushed you for the question. And this is a room of population health scientists. I will let you draw your own conclusions. Um, uh, I'll skip this one. Okay, because that was no, it's fine. All right, challenge three, challenge three. We cannot think in dichotomies. And we love thinking in dichotomies. We are used to thinking in dichotomies. There's many reasons why we think in dichotomies, not least of which is because our funding happens in dichotomies. We like disease, no disease. Uh, right now, I have the privilege of serving as Dean of School of Public Health at Boston University, where we run the Framingham study, in the, one of the longest cohorts in the world. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the things that emerged from Framingham study, as many of you will know, is the cholesterol risk formula. Cholesterol risk formula says that cholesterol is bad, obviously with a lot of nuance, right, that came from Framingham. 
So we all know this, and as a result of this, sort of most people in this room on a regular basis go to a healthcare provider and get your cholesterol checked, right? And she will say cholesterol good, cholesterol bad, etc. And things follow from that, drugs, exercise, etc. So I want to show you the Framingham data about cholesterol. The Framingham data about cholesterol looks like this. This is serum cholesterol. The black line are people with, without heart disease. The dotted line are people with heart disease. What's the thing that you look at when you look at these two curves? They look almost exactly the same, right? That's from the Framingham data that brought you cholesterol testing as a trillion dollar industry. Um, um, so is the Framingham data wrong? Is the risk equation wrong? No, of course it's not wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. It's because saying that cholesterol is a risk factor is a dichotomizing. You draw a line, you, you, you create a two by two table, AD over BC, AD is bigger than BC, more than one, hence cholesterol is a risk. That is totally different than saying that the population level cholesterol is going to differentiate us our likelihood of having heart disease or not having heart disease. We make this mistake all the time when we focus then on reducing cholesterol by only dealing with outliers, which of course means that a population health intervention approach should focus, should focus on shifting population curves. What we publish, our industry publishes predominantly, like I've never done the math, but I'm sure it's 95 plus percent, relative risk measures of various stripes, relative risk measures. But relative risk measures are terrible at giving us population level differentiation, curve separation. What relative risk do you need to end up with curve separation? Anybody know? You need relative risk measure about 350. Raise your hand if you've published a paper with a relative risk of 350. <laughs> I have not had that pleasure yet. I suspect I shall die without having that. Okay, that's point three. Challenge for prediction. We love making predictions and uh, somehow it makes us feel strong and robust when we make predictions. And in population health, it is very difficult to make predictions and we need to wrap our brain around that, that even as, even as we're in the business, this whole panel is about generating evidence-based policy, it is difficult to make predictions for many, many reasons, not the least of which is that populations are complex population systems that frequently behave in unpredictable ways. Now, wh why is that? What does that look like? I'll go back to another paper from Framingham. This looks at genotype scores. These are genotype scores for diabetes and the uh, cumulative incidence, or better put, the risk of diabetes on the y-axis. So what you see here is, this is not simple genes, a genotype score, more genotype score, more risk of, um, of diabetes, right? So when you look at this, when you look at this, what do you, what do you think? We well, say, well, first, that's a good slide to use as an example of a dose-response relationship that I can use in my introductory teaching classes, right? The second thing you think about when you look at this, you're like, huh. I wonder what my genotype score is. Because you want to know, right? You look at that like, wow, look at that, it's pretty clear. And we can't avoid that thinking. The reason I like this paper is because that same paper also has this curve. This curve shows the two curves, diabetes and not diabetes, and genotype score, showing you, of course, that there's absolutely no difference at the population level, depending on what your genotype score is. Because the distinction at the, the distinction is at the population level is not usefully predictive of who is going to be having um, uh, diabetes or non-diabetes. So this is a challenge that we have all the time. Prediction is enormously limited. It is unfortunately, unfortunately, in some respects, the, our fascination with prediction is what has resulted in, uh, in, in our quest for genetic prediction to be the, I'm trying to think of, choose my words carefully um, because we're in the National Academy of Sciences, the, um, the, 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 um, the animating um, uh, force in, our bio, in this biomedical research era. And uh, it is, while I want to be very clear on the record, I'm all for discovery science, it is a mistake to think that's going to lead us to disease prediction simply because the math doesn't hold up. And for anybody who's interested in the math not holding up, I'm going to show you three math and heavy slides um, from a paper first started by Professor Keyes, who's in the audience. Um, so I'll try not to make any mistakes. But um, um, very, very briefly, this is, uh, there's a lot here, so I'm just going to go through it very quickly. What this paper does is it simply says, you look at the prevalence of a genetic factor, see all these x-axis are prevalence genetic factor. This is the um, baseline likelihood of, of a particular um, uh, disease. So this, this here is, goes back to a high likelihood baseline condition, and this is environmental uh, conditions. So here is more environmental conditions, here is less environmental condition. And in this paper, we work through the predictive capacity of particular genes. And there are many conclusions here, but I'll just go through them quickly. Number one is the prevalence at all prevalence of a particular gene, the risk ratio ultimately is driven not by the gene itself, but by the environment and by the likelihood of the particular 
um, factor itself, by the background rate of disease. That's number one. Second conclusion is every level of the gene, the risk ratio and risk difference, ultimately are driven by the prevalence of the environmental factor, which is consistent with the first thing I showed you before. And the third observation is that at every prevalence of um, any genetic factor, the risk ratio decreases as the background rate of disease increases. And that ultimately gets back to the principle of ubiquity that I showed you earlier, that because the forces that matter are ubiquitous, their difference ends up being relatively small on these factors, but that's okay because when you shift something that's ubiquitous, you shift whole populations. So ultimately, prediction is a bit of a mug's game in the context of population health. So those are the four big challenges, and I think unless we keep those challenges in mind, we are, we, we, we are doomed a little bit to entering into cul-de-sac of trying to create evidence that can guide policy with the intention of informing population health, but falling short of actually informing population health. Um, all of this, just bringing this together, just so it's not sort of simply four things that I'm telling you about um, in random, come from a set of principles of population health science, which Professor Keyes and I articulated in a book a couple of years ago, and these are sort of four of those principles, but ultimately, that's intended to inform our thinking about how we should approach generating evidence for the creation of population health. And as I conclude, I'll just conclude with, um, with, a, with, with a point, with this very simple point, that in some respects, everything old is new again, or like there's really nothing new under the sun. That, that, um, but we have had these, these, this challenge with creating policy for, with creating evidence for policy and population health for a while, and, and we've been stuck on this for a while in no small part because we cannot help but think about the biomedical paradigm that informs so much of what we do. And we cannot help but think that we're looking for simple, interventions, simple buttons to press that will change everything. Populations are not like that. Populations are complex, are complex entities with emergent properties and require much more thought than that. If you think about the founding mythologies of public health, this is Jon Snow and the Broad Street Pump, they ultimately rest on this notion of the simple intervention. And of course, the notion of simple intervention was false even then, because this is the epidemic curve of cholera in uh, mid-19th century London, and this is when the Broad Street pump was closed. And you can all see, whether you're infectious disease epidemiologists or not, that that ultimately made very little difference, because it was a complex of many other forces that made a difference. So the reason I'm ending on this is to say, A, the arc of my talk was, we have had population-based interventions that have worked. We do have some evidence about things that do work. There are real challenges in generating that evidence, but if we are to meet the challenge that was presented in the two keynotes at this meeting, we need to generate this evidence. And I think we will only do that successfully if we keep the challenges that are articulated here today in mind. Thank you. Thank you for having me.